seated. I said we'll be in Romans 2 for those who like to follow along with their Bible close at hand or maybe their, their particular notes of preference. But as we continue, I want to make sure we understand where we've gone before in case you're just joining us this week. Because if you dive into the book of Romans, you encounter a bunch of things right out of the gate. It makes no qualms and does not shy away from talking about the real wrath of God. And then it goes on to say, as we dealt with as we move through chapter 1, it talks about just looking at God's creation. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you were raised a good Jew, as of course this audience in Paul's time might have been thinking about, or if you were raised outside of the Jewish nation and a Gentile. He said just by simply looking at God's creation, his attributes make it so that we are without excuse to acknowledge the one true God. And in fact, then, not only do we tangle ourselves up so much in sin, then God talks about a really tough concept and has Paul explain what it means that God sometimes just gives us over to our sin. And then he, before we then settle in on our favorite disgusting sins and want to wag our fingers, he then makes sure to say that actually condoning sin, Propping up, being part of a culture that props up sin as not being sin or excusing it or minimizing it. Actually, it almost seems to be a step beyond the committing of it. So the consensus of men, as one commentator said last week, is almost worse than the committing of the sinners within it. It becomes a corrupt culture. And so he's been very, he's been, his admonishing has, there's been no holes barred, right? Last week was pretty stern, pretty convicting. And then we see, as we finished up last week, as we begin to dig into chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. So there, do you presume on the riches of his, God's? Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? It says, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Now, in this passage, he's talking to Jews specifically who are presuming upon certain things that they shouldn't when it comes to assuming they've got salvation. He's like, you think you're safe? Well, but you're not. You're storing up wrath for the day of judgment. You think you have salvation, but the reality is you face the same fate as those other people out there that you dismiss as damned. And folks, this is a dangerous place to be. And not just, you're like, well, okay, that doesn't apply to me. He's talking to Jews. And, no, this is a dangerous place for any of us to be, and we could be there. It's not just applicable in terms of Paul speaking to the Jews. Paul's going to be talking about a dangerous place to be that we should bear in mind, even in our own hearts and minds. Well, let's ease into that, because it's another tough, weird, meaty text. And let me ask you, hopefully, a simpler question. If I say the word trope, what do you guys think of? If we talk about tropes, what's a trope? What do you, any, anybody? You don't actually have to raise your hand, just call it out. Recurring theme? Stereotype? Stereotype? A cliche of character. A cliche of character? That's fair. But I'll give you the one I, I actually pasted in here. It's come, describing commonly recurring literary and rhetorical devices, motifs, or cliches in creative works, a common or overused theme or device. Uh, we watched a movie, uh, what was it called? We watched Unbreakable and Split and then went to see a new M. Night Shyamalan movie this weekend, just kind of dealing with superheroes. I found this online, it's a Venn diagram of superhero comic tropes. We're not gonna go through them all. And actually, <laughs> looking at the names of the superheroes, I actually disagree with the placement, but we're not gonna get into that either. But there's some, there's some tropes, right? The tragically dead parents, wearing underwear on the outside, the cape, and, you know, and not all of them share all of the tropes, but they recur enough that certainly, so there's people in the center there, you know, Magneto, Superman, and Martian Manhunter, they got them all, <laughs> right? So, so those are tropes. Uh, can any of you guys, outside of superheroes, when you guys think of like, what's a, what's a trope or a cliche in storytelling? What's, what's something that always happens? It's just sort of absurd or recurring. Anyone? Happily ever after. I, they, they, they all, and they all live happily ever after, the end of the fairy tale, right? That's a, that's, a tra that's a classic trope of every princess story. How about the car that explodes? 
How about the inexplicable car that just explodes for no reason in all those old 70s and 80s action movies? Right? It's just like they ran into each other, they don't it's just boom, they both blow. Why do they blow up? If it's a pinto, I understand. <laughs> or the, the craziest one sometimes is it'll go off the cliff and it explodes before it hits the bottom? Like what? It's just like going through the air, suddenly it gets flammable? Like what? I want to talk about one very specific that you see in it turns up in every police show at some point, or every police procedural, and that's diplomatic immunity. The diplomatic immunity story. This was in the 80s, the 90s. It was in the movie show 24. Like, I remember it all over the place. Now, your laws don't apply to me. There's always that current. There's the person in the country or the kingdom, and he, but they're exempt from being judged by the laws that govern the kingdom because of some special assignment that they've been given, some special position that they have, some certificate that they flash. I have diplomatic immunity. I guess that's the guy from Lethal Weapon 2. That's a, that's a flashback there. See, the Jews were thinking wrongly on this kind of concept. And I don't want us to just be like, then we could do some finger-wagging at that history and time and people. But so can Christians. So let's go ahead as we join in. Let's start in Romans 2, verse 6. Paul says he, and he's talking about God. He will render to each according to his works. To those who buy patience in well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will also be tribulation. And distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first, and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first, and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. It goes on in verse 12 to say, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God, and know his will and approve what is excellent, because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who say, while well, you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. For circumcision indeed is a value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who's uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's start with that kind of, perhaps for some of you, mind-bending first one there. Verse 6, he will render each one according to his works. Wait, what? I thought, didn't I hear something about grace in one of those songs we sang this morning? Didn't I hear something about nothing but the blood of Jesus, not nothing but by the works of James? Right, the Christian very naturally will read this verse at first, first blush and say, I, I thought I was saved by grace, through faith, not by works that no man can boast. Isn't that written somewhere? Yeah, it's Ephesians 2. Well, who wrote Ephesians 2? Paul, same guy. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the result of works that no one may boast. So, like, 
is Paul contradicting himself? This, I will confess, this is kind of like the most annoying Facebook status. It's complicated, right? Like relationship, it's complicated. Ugh, it's like that's, that's the most annoying Facebook thing to put. Only in this case, let's be clear, lest anybody think I'm saying anything about God. The annoying part here isn't on God, but it's on my own impatience and probably sin. I won't see, I desire God's word to fit on one bumper sticker, 140 characters for my tweet, and I want it to be reductionistic. Remember last week, I read from a commentator that said the whole first portion leading all through Romans, all the way up to chapter 3, verse 20, it is in some ways like one continuous thought. It's me like, oh my goodness. It's more than, it's more like a 10 second sentence. I can't keep that train of thought. Well, we have to, we have to fight for it then. Right? Paul's building a case over, two, over four weeks as we take it on Sundays. So trust me, when we get to Romans 3.20, just feel it looming. That's, that's the storm there. That's the looming and coming storm. Everything we're talking about up to 3.20 is going to culminate when he says in that verse 20, spoilers, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since the law, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Okay, so at this point in Paul's articulation, then what is he saying? Commentators will actually discuss a couple of ways of looking at it, both of which are fine. One is, let's, let's pretend... Like, what some, some commentators would say what he's doing here is he's taking the gospel. This isn't really the gospel, but what does the gospel mean, literally? Good news. Good news. So like, here's the good news of the gospel. And Paul's saying, all right, I'm going to talk to my Jewish audience and also my Gentiles. But all right, this good news of Jesus stuff, we're just going to put it over here for a minute. Now let's just talk about law. So that's what's going on. It's not, it's not that he's saying. He's talking about, all right, technically, everybody's going to be judged by their works. Let's just, it's, it's the same thing I would do sometimes. It, it seems to always confuse. I'm not, I'm not knocking. It confuses a lot of people. I try to have a conversation sometimes or a debate with people who don't believe as I believe. Let, let's take, for instance, an atheist. I'll say, all right, fine. You want, let's talk on your terms. Let's assume there is no God. Why not kill your neighbor? And usually some of them, how dare you? I thought you were a Christian. It's like, no, no, you, did you miss what I just said? Let's assume there is no God for a minute. I'm not standing on my Christian foundation. Why shouldn't I kill my neighbor? So that's what, some people think that's what Paul's doing here. He's talking about how God will judge people. Let's put aside the good news of Jesus for a minute. Let's talk about how he judges people by their works. Well, that's totally true. Right? He says, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. And apart from the gospel, this is how it works. Do good, you get glory, honor, immortality. You do evil, you get what? Wrath, fury, tribulation. For God shows no partiality. And God is the perfect judge. Now, how does this work out in the simplest way in God's economy? Well, just like this. Do good. That was Jesus. Do evil. That's everybody else. Right? That's what he's painting here is a picture building to th chapter 3, verse 20, where we all have to realize, oh, oh no, like under the law, we're all totally screwed unless there's a third option here. Ding, 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 ding. Right? That it's over there, and he's going to bring it into the picture. Douglas Moo, great commentator, says, Paul goes out of his way to stress that the word that God so rewards is a persistent lifestyle of godliness. In contrast to those people who are characterized by selfishness and who disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. As the contrast makes clear, there are two and only two fates in store for every person at the time of God's righteous judgment. He's talking, what's he talking about? I mean, Paul's talking about judgment day. And sometimes we all have to pause, even as Christians, and actually stop for a minute and remember, this is a real thing. This is a real thing, folks. This is, this is not hypothetical. This is not a sequel to Terminator. Right? This is something very real. This is an actual day that you and I and every man and woman who has ever lived or who ever will live and who's living right now will see. He says in verse 12, all who sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. 
Right? As, as he makes the case about last week, last week he made the case, we're without excuse to say, well, I didn't know the one true God. Like simply by looking at his, what we call general revelation, even without the special revelation of scripture, God says he holds us accountable just because we've looked out, we've seen his creation and try to say there, is, there either is no God or I'm gonna redefine him as not like the one true God. We're without excuse. Here he's saying, even if we didn't technically have the law, if I, if I didn't grow up with a Bible in the house, if I didn't grow up with the Torah and the Jewish uh, in the time Paul's talking about, he's saying, no, you're without excuse. The law is written on our hearts. So if we know scripture, we're guilty. If we had no scripture, he's still saying there's no excuse. There's only two fates, deemed righteous or deemed unrighteous. There's only two fates, heaven, hell. And so he's trying to provoke that question inside us. How do we find ourselves on the side that isn't wrath and fury? That's the question that should be on everybody's lips. How do I not stand under wrath and fury? That, that is preferable. And Paul wants to make sure, he wants to make it very clear that many Jews in his day had it wrong. Right? John Murray said the presumptuous Jew interpreted the special goodness of God to him as a guarantee of immunity from the criteria by which other men would be judged. And so he would claim for himself indulgence on the part of God. The Gentile needed repentance, not him. I'm God's chosen. I have diplomatic immunity. Doesn't matter what I do. I got my lineage papers all the way back to Abraham. I got my record of rituals, I got, I got, I got circumcision. But the idea was, he was saying like, all right, I'm a Jew, I'm part of Israel, I'm good. And then the obvious thought was, well, I can indulge my sin because there's no life of repentance required. In fact, I can sin just like the Gentiles, but I'm different because I'm Jewish. Got my diplomatic community. Thomas Schreiner makes clear in his commentary, the Jews, despite their covenant with God, Paul is saying, cannot shield themselves from God's wrath, wrath just by appealing to God's favor. Right? We can't just say, well, well my great, 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 42 greats, Abraham, great-grandfather was Abraham. He's the man of promise, so I'm good, right? I did some Jewish stuff, I did some Sabbath stuff, I did some rituals and stuff, so I'm good, right? No, Paul emphasizes judgment by works to remind the Jews that merely being Jew doesn't spare one from God's wrath. God judges Jews and Gentiles by the same standard. He'll judge unrepentant Jews because not all who, not all who affiliate is as Israel are actual Israel. He says it, it depends on what? The heart. That's really easy then for you and I to read Romans from a very detached point of view and be like, oh, those foolish Israelites. First there was that golden calf thing. Now Paul's condemning them for this thing. What a screwed up mindset. But we should be careful. And we should be far more humble. Because there is something really rampant in God's church today. And it's pretty similar. It just says, I'm a Christian, saved by grace. So I'm good, right? No life of repentance required. I can sin just like the non-Christians, but I'm different because I know that grace thing. John Murray said, works without, re works without redemptive aspiration are dead works. But aspiration without good works is presumption. <clears throat> Paul's making clear, there is no grace by affiliation. True grace causes transformation. Transformation, right? There's nobody who's going to get to heaven and say, well, my parents were Christian, I went to church as a kid, and... You know, Christmas and Easter later, I did some Christian stuff, I did some service, I did a missionary trip, and, and some commandments, so I'm good, right? Now, Paul, well, his emphasis on judgment by works can remind Christians that merely affiliating as Christian and doing some Christian stuff doesn't spare one from God's wrath. He's making the case here that there is a physical Israel, but not, who are, not all who are Israel are actually Israel. He said there's a spiritual Israel. There, there are Jews that are Jews of the heart. It's the same thing with the church. God will judge unrepentant people who simply call themselves Christians. Note the air quotes. Because not all who affiliate as the church are the church. 
in modern times, we often talk about that in terms of the visible church. A lot of people streaming into a church on Sunday. That doesn't mean they actually know Jesus. That doesn't mean they're actually saved. And it, I was at Planet Fitness the other day, and they got to, I think it was, uh, I think it was Bruce actually telling me, I didn't know, but because Kat, Kat and I have been members for a while, but apparently they had a New Year thing where you pay a buck to get your membership going. Let's talk about genuine gym membership for a moment. Planet Fitness has this dollar sign up. Hey, that's cheap. That's almost like free grace, right? I bet actually, if you, if you actually really want it in, and act, I bet the cashier would probably plunk that dollar in for you. I guess a buck. What cashier there at the Planet Fitness Register wouldn't just pay it? Like one dollar. They say, like, this is an easy in. Your opt-in is almost nothing. In fact, maybe Planet Fitness will pay the price for your fitness salvation, right? So then I get my little Planet Fitness card. It's, it's, in, my, it's in my wallet in my office. Let me ask you a question. Does that mean I'm fit? No, not a chance. I'm not fit. Does having the membership card mean I'm fit? No, not at all. Does knowing now what? What if I could tell you everything about Planet Fitness? I could tell you everything about that, the, how many buildings they had, their location, when they were founded. What if I had knew every single detail about Planet Fitness and my card? Does that mean I'm fit? Does knowing everything about Planet Fitness and, and everything about all their machines and how they work? Knowledge, not at all. Does putting in some token appearances mean I'm fit? Not at all. What would it mean to be a genuine gym member? Right, it would mean a changed lifestyle, because there'd be what? Gym visits. Not just knowing what all the equipment does, but you know, maybe being on that elliptical every once in a while. Maybe asking a trainer to train me, kind of like being a disciple. Persevering to the end of the year. Instead of, you know, doing it from about January to mid-March, and then somehow other things in life choke it out. Right, there'd be visible fruit. Now the visible fruit would vary. Some people would look like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Some people would look like, you know, me and Jim Parsons from Big Bang Theory. <laughs> but we could still both be fit, although it may be in different various portions. And maybe there'd even be injury. I would fall down on the treadmill, but then there would be recovery. Come 2020, then, you would really ask, okay, who's a genuine gym member? And you could know. And some people I've often joke, yeah, I signed up for that dollar at the beginning of the year, and I never went back. What does it mean to be a genuine Christian, then? The gospel's clear. It involves a changed lifestyle. The gospel takes root and transforms. It's not just knowing the truth, but it's doing the truth. Maybe it involves usually asking a more mature Christian and being a disciple, like a trainer. And yes, as God says, those who persevere to the end will be saved. That's also right there in Scripture. That there would be visible fruit that would vary, but some would be there. Maybe there'd be stumble, maybe there'd be setback, but there would be repentance and recovery. If not, Paul is saying here, you're going to be judged by the law. So, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what's excellent because you're instructed from the law, and if you're sure... Are you sure? Now see, some of you hear that laundry list and some of you will start chafing, and I understand it. I've chafed too and had to dig in and study. I, okay, help me God, I don't understand sometimes how the scripture is talking about my works and how they're involved. They don't save me, but they'll be there. Like, some of you will chafe and say, well, what's the difference really? You're saying, I'm not saved by my works. But if there's no works, I might not be saved? Well, stay with me, because, yeah, it's complicated. Paul's not trying to put it on a bumper sticker. He's taken multiple chapters to get it going on. But he then says those in God's family who rely on the law should do what? They should know his will. They should approve what's good. They should receive instruction. They should guide others, says they're blind. Bring light to darkness. Teach the immature. Have the truth. That's what we should be seeing in the people. And then he admonishes them, right? Because he's like, you are... He's like, this is what you should be doing, but goodness, you guys need to teach yourselves. There's a problem here. And he says, if, okay, if, if this is what you ought to be doing, then Paul says, so then why are you hypocrites? 
Why do you indulge in the same sins and presume on God's favor? Like, if you should be this, why are you over here? My wife and I uh, were watching this uh, series based on the books, uh, the Lemony Snicket books. There was actually an episode where they were following, they had to follow this bizarre legal system, and so they all had to be blind. And there was a point in the show then where literally they got, well, I'll take you to the courtroom, and he's got his blindfold on, leading the kids who have the blindfold and just bumping into things. It's literally the blind leading the blind. It was a beautiful illustration there, just in the middle of a, a kind of a kid's, of a family show. And in fact, then, but really, you know the tragic extra illustration in that story? Some of them were blind, trying to lead others who were blind, and they were in a building that was burning. It's sadly apt to the apostle's caution here as he's talking to the people. And then he says, you know, he says, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Gentiles blaspheme God because of you. That, that is tragic. By 2 Corinthians 5, Paul would go on to say, Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ. Make God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Right? But we have to be careful here. Being ambassadors for Christ does not mean we have diplomatic immunity, we don't get to keep on sinning with impunity. We don't get to act like all the other people out there and just be like, oh, the difference, difference between you and me, non-Christian? God can't touch me. I have diplomatic immunity. It's called grace. Then we'll just get to the day of judgment. We don't get to the day of judgment and just have to remember the right verse. That's not the way it works. And that's one of the reasons I think that some people are still resistant, stubborn, and suppressing the truth of the gospel today. Because they can point at Christians and say, look at them. That's a ridiculous gospel. And they're right because it's being misrepresented. They can say, your grace is disgusting. You just you act like you have a get out of hell free card because you just say the name Jesus in grace and you do the same things we do. That, that is ridiculous. If we're not moving daily from being the same to striving for lives set apart, then God's name is being blasphemed because of us. That's a, that's a terrible thought. It's a terrible thought I've represented. You don't get to be over 40 and not have to confess somewhere I've purported to be a Christian and not acted like one. And probably some, somebody has blasphemed the name of God because they saw my hypocrisy. That's something I need to repent of and seek to continuously repent of. Paul's clear there's no salvation apart from repentance. That's the point. Like salvation and repentance are intertwined. And there's no saint without works. Mere possession of the law and occasionally obedient, occasional obedience to the commands doesn't spare from judgment day. There's nothing inherently salvific and no advantage in that. One commentator said this, and here again, it's where it gets tricky, but we'll get to the parsing how one word can make all the difference. Since Paul asserts that works are necessary in for necessary with salvation, and also that one cannot be justified by works of the law, it's probable that he didn't see these two themes as contradictory. Like, wait, what? I can't be justified by works of the law, but works are going to be intertwined with salvation? How do I understand that? See, some of you will say, some of you know, every other religion you're going to encounter out there proclaims salvation by work. They call it karma, or they call it working before, you know, get, meriting your salvation, doing good things. Like, isn't this really, James, isn't this tantamount to the same thing? Isn't Paul just sort of waving his hands around, but kind of saying the same thing? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Just because something might be in the same ballpark doesn't mean it's in the same field. Close enough is not close enough. Words matter and precision matters. My easiest way that I keep it in my own mind is remembering just a simple difference that would be between a parent and a child. Tell me if these two statements are different and matter. I try to be a good child so my parents will love me. 
I try to be a good child because my parents love me. It's just a word or two. It's almost the same, right? It's just a word or two different. And that word means everything. That one word and one slightly altered phrase means everything. And it is exactly the same as salvation in the gospel when it comes to our works, and it matters. There is every difference between trying to say, I obey my Father in heaven so he will save me. And I obey my Father in heaven because he saved me. Does that matter without question? God's word says, and God's word tells us, a true child of God will be revealed by the latter. Not saved by the former. Makes all the difference. The former applies to almost every false religion and distortion of Christianity. The latter is one of the very few things that makes Christianity unique amongst all other faith options. That's what makes it true. Now, okay, is my salvation absolutely proven by the works I can count? No. Is it definitively and absolutely proven by external actions? No, that's why Paul goes on again here at the, near the end to talk about circumcision. I have no visual illustration for this one. <laughs> right? He says it has some value, but if you break it, it becomes uncircumcision. He who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you. Right? So, you know, there's people out there who are uncircumcised to keep the law better than you. They can come up and condemn you. Again, many Jews presumed upon their outward signs. I'm marked. Well, what might we inadvertently presume upon in similar fashion? Baptism? Well, I mean, there's, there's a good, fairly direct corollary right there. Our signs and seals are different. Maybe for maybe it's not baptism. Maybe it's your church going. Maybe it's your Jesus fish on the back of the car. Maybe it's your cross tattoo. I don't know, it's the 21st century. Right? Church membership doesn't save. People without the signs but haven't sinned like you have, they can probably call, you know, they can just stand up and call foul on that. Your outward signs are meaningless. The physical sign of the covenant doesn't mean you're in it. If that's all you really are, Paul says you'll be condemned by the law. Those who are circumcised or outward law-keeping or upstanding-looking Jews in Paul's day will ultimately still stand condemned by the law. But by the same token, the card-carrying, Protestant, Presbyterian, choir singing, Sunday school teaching, best dish at the potluck, bringing affiliated Christian headed for the wrong side of Judgment Day is just as condemned, apart from the gospel. So, question, so chapter 3 begins with a very important question. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So people would say, people say well, then what difference does it make being a Jew? Well, it was very important. Like, you were entrusted with the oracles of God. You had the Torah. You were scooped up and blessed by be part of his people for generations. And now the gospel is going out to the Gentiles. Don't, yes, you're condemned apart from the saving grace of Jesus, just like they are. But don't then say, well, I guess it was worthless being a Jew this whole time. Ask it in a way that applies to even us as Christians. Ask it in a way that applies to any generation of God's people. What value is there in being part of a believing culture? Well, what value is it that I was baptized? What value is it that I was baptized at nine years old? Fifteen, I just went prodigal. Didn't matter, right? Now Paul's saying, you have the scriptures. Now the answer is the same. You had the wealth. You had the treasure trove, dummies. That's what he's saying. Okay, he, did, he didn't say dummy. That's Paul's harsher than I am. He's less harsh. It's not true. He gets pretty harsh. But what's better? Let me ask you guys. What's better, starting with a library or an empty room clueless where to begin? Starting from zero or starting from, but from full but uninterested? I'm, the, I'm actually one of those perfect examples. Raised in church. Parents worked. My dad was a public school teacher who... My mom stayed home. I don't know how he saved up or scrapped enough money, but managed to send my brother and I to a Christian school until high school. I, I forgot to bring it. I have this little vest from, uh, from you know, midweek kids study. It's it called Kingdom Kids, and I have this little felt vest with all these pins for my scripture reading and different things pinned all over it. Now, sure, 
My interest waxed and waned, and eventually at 15, I just threw it all kind of in mental storage, just put it, put it in the storage unit in the back of my brain. At 15, I was like, Jesus, whatever. But at 25, when it was Jesus forever, suddenly I went back to that mental storage facility, I rolled up the door, and oh, guess what happened? Now it's a treasure trove. It had totally changed. Oh wait, I had totally changed. Oh wait, God had totally changed me. Best way to put it. What was the advantage? It was a foolish question. Paul's calling that out. And then, and then again, he decides to take him down a couple more pegs. So let's brace ourselves. In verse 3 through 8, he says, What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written that you'll be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? For if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. Now that's a mind twister. I had to read it like 10 times and read three books about it. But here's, what, here's what's being asked here. Well, if God has promised salvation to Israel, how does his promise fare if the majority of Jews were and are unfaithful? What's going on with God then? God said he'd save them, but if so many are unfaithful and thus condemned, aren't they kind of invalidating God's promise as if that could happen? But God remains true. He said he'd save Israel. You guys have all heard the saying, right? You can't see the forest for the trees. Right? If God says, I will save the pines, and a big fire comes, and he uproots two of them and goes and replants them in a new valley, did he fail in his promise? Of course not. It might not be the way you were thinking it would go or hoping it would go. But the argument here against Paul is that literally, this argument against Paul literally can't see the trees for the forest. Like, oh, no, he's saving some. He is faithful to his promise. If a whole bunch of Jews aren't really Jews or circumcised in the heart, that's not on God. Paul's saying Jews are in bondage to sin just as much as Gentiles are. And if God saves any of the Jews, he's true to his promise. If he grafts in any number of non-Jews to his plan of salvation, he's true to his promise. And he made Abraham, you'll be a blessing to all nations. So apparently, that's why so his opponents try this one weird mind bender at the end. He's like, all right, if we are so unrighteous that we don't have the ability to do what's right, apart from God's electing grace, then wouldn't God be unrighteous in visiting his wrath on us? Wow. Wow. Anytime, wouldn't God be unrighteous comes out of your mouth, you should just fear spontaneous combustion. <laughs> if we can't do it on our own, then the game's rigged and God shouldn't hold us accountable. And Paul tells, tells he's speaking to the Jews, remember, in verse 6, he's like, well, by that logic, he can't judge any of those Gentiles that you kind of want to see condemned. You're saying God doesn't have the right to judge sinners? That because they're so unrighteous, they can't make themselves clean? He then has no right to hold them accountable for their sin? They apparently took it even further. Like, if God's righteousness and glory is... It, so, the, here's one of their great if-then statements. Okay, if God's righteousness and glory is revealed by our unrighteousness, why do we get condemned? My wickedness and falling short actually is what's showing how awesome he is. Now, this seems ridiculous on the face of it, right? How can God say, I'm bad? His glory is revealed in judgment. That means he needs somebody to judge. I'm actually serving his purpose, showing how holy he is. Maybe I should even practice evil to bring about the greater good. God's glory will look so good in contrast with me. What? By this logic, we should all thank Adolf Hitler, and we should stop condemning him as a culture. And it's just ridiculous logic. Thanks, Adolf. I haven't attacked and tried to conquer the free world, so I look pretty righteous by comparison. Thanks, Adolf. By condemning you, my virtue signaling is complete. Couldn't have done it without you. Six million Jews in ovens. I'm never going to look that bad, so I can actually say at least I'm not Hitler. Seriously? So actually, Hitler's pretty useful then, 
By condemning him, I look good, so actually then I shouldn't condemn him? <laughs> this is the stupid logic that's happening here. Really? So God looks, you look more righteous by how bad I am? So really then you should be happy? No. See, some were saying Paul's teachings or Christian teaching was espousing this because they had a misunderstanding of grace and works and the way it goes together. It's like, it's likely many opponents of Christianity were, they, it's not that they believed these arguments, but they were kind of making them just to try to pick apart the faith, just to attack. They're just being malicious. So we could say, all right, those are ridiculous arguments, but, but are they? Are they? Because I look out occasionally at the propensity, and anytime we push too far on grace without understanding God's wrath and what we're being saved from, and anytime we talk about a grace that doesn't involve works in any manner, way, shape, or form, we start running the risk of looking like these crazy arguments Paul is being accused of. This, this actually manifests today, I see, in, in a perversion of using the phrase when you explain that you're broken. I'm broken. I'm broken before God. That's, there's, a, there's a right way to use that, but the way I see it twisted in contemporary culture, what we're, what we're saying but not saying is, my falling short is what shows how awesome God is, so I'll remain content right here in my present sinful ways. Look at how broken I am. God is so amazing. Isn't Jesus wonderful? I still sin every day. My goodness, I, I can't change anything. I'm just waiting on him. Isn't he amazing? I still use profanity. Isn't he amazing? I don't, I don't really stop drinking too much. Isn't that amazing? I'm still rude and a jerk to people. Thank God for grace. I'm totally relying on Jesus. What are we saying without words? We're saying my falling short is showing how awesome he is, so I'm going to remain content and actually use that as a way to show how glorious he is. And I'm going to call it broken so people give me sympathy and then say how awesome God is. That's a dangerous snare if we go too far with the right understanding of being broken and contrite in our sin. The last big word you get to learn today is syllogismus practicus. Anybody? Who, who knows the practical syllogism? Well, here's an example of a syllogism. Di major premise, diligent students do their homework. Minor premise, Amy and Andy are diligent students. Conclusion, Amy and Andy do their homework. Matthew 7, 17 through 20, Jesus gives an admonition. He says, even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree can't bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Luke 3 says, therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. See how repentance is tied together? It's not apart from salvation. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. John 15 says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you'd go and bear fruit, that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. And Paul in Colossians says, so walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's, that's the admonition and maybe examination for us today. That we sometimes have to ask ourselves and examine ourselves and ask God, where am I bearing fruit? Right? Because the reality is, in summary, we don't have diplomatic immunity. Now, some of us have to ask, am I relying on knowledge or affiliation to save me? Is that what I'm presuming upon? Because that's the wrong place. Genuine gym membership is not signing up and having the card. That's the call to all of us. And then for us to ask ourselves sincerely then, if, if I'm looking at my life and it seems kind of barren, then I'm called by Scripture to ask God, where is my faith? Where is my fruit? Now, where is my faith? It's in the saving power and the sacrifice and blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 But if I am truly transformed by the reality and the good news of the gospel, if it has been given to me and changed me, then I do need to ask that question, where is my fruit? I know some of you, some of you think very cautiously, well, I don't want to focus on that to the point of being puffed up and prideful. I was talking with our guys this week at our, our 
men's happy hours, and we were going through Psalm 9. It says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. Guys, God created everything and called a people and saved them by the blood and power of Jesus Christ. Two good works. By keeping account of the fruit being born in my life, that doesn't have anything to do with pride. I will recount all of the Lord's wonderful deeds. Every fruit bearing, every way that I'm following him today and have put sin to death, that is praise to God, not mine. Keeping account of what God has by his spirit enabled me to do to show that I have borne fruit so that I can have more assurance, that is a blessing. I look at the reality of faith because he is proving it to me in very tangible ways. It gives a comfort that gives me great assurance. I hope that is helpful to all of us because just like I might go to the gym and even if in the course of a year, even in the course of 10 years, I can only measure the difference in my chest by a millimeter or two. If I can look at my life and see even just the meagerest of little fruit offerings that taste so sweet, that is a blessed assurance absolutely that Jesus is mine. That is a confirmation and an expectation. But that is then God calling us in like the child who earnestly seeks to love and obey, not so that they'll be loved, but because they are loved. That heart should be manifesting in my life if I am truly his child. And if it's not or it hasn't, then my prayer for you today is that you'd be saved. Or maybe for some of us it has gone stagnant and we want to be fruit bearing again. So we're going to close with a couple songs. The ushers will take an offering during that first one. But I want to pray for us and invite you guys to pray with me as the Spirit leads your heart. And so, Father, we come to you, and I pray we come with our right humility. God, even just the humility that your Scripture can be complicated and, and play havoc with our minds, I pray that it would have a godly provocation. That those of us who presume and indulge upon an idea of grace without actually knowing your sweet salvation would come to save in faith today. And any of us apart from that would know you and you would put their spirit in them and give them a true heart of transformation that desires them to seek righteousness, desires to not be content with the way you have found us, that you do love us as we sing, just as I am, but you don't leave us there, and our assurance of faith comes not from knowledge, but knowledge plus the amazing assurance of evidence in our lives as you grow, changing our affections, changing our actions, showing us that we are becoming little by little maturing disciples in your faith. And for any of us who have fallen off the wagon today, I pray, pray our prayer would be that you would give us fruitful multiplication, that we would see fruit bearing again, that our assurance, even if we already have some, would be multiplied and magnified so that people would see us and they would have no cause by looking at us to blaspheme the gospel. But instead, they would see us and have at least a hint of curiosity or a transformative experience with your good news, and they would come to know Jesus. I pray none of us would leave here today without knowing the sweet salvation that we have in Jesus Christ or starting to hunger to know more about it in your name.